I've listened to The Color and the Shape by Foo Fighters for months. And I listened to it once yesterday. Welcome to Spin It. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Spin It, the record-ranking podcast for people who would rather be listening to music. I'm James, and with me, say hello. Not not Connor, say hello to them. Audience, say hello to Connor. It's Connor. How you doing? We're getting down to the end of the year here. The end of the calendar year, not the end of the podcast year. Right. Year of healing, still going strong. It is. We've got one more week. I mean, this is the one more week before Spinter Wonderland next week, and then it's New Year's, then it's 2024. Wow. But first, I'm excited for this week. Foo Fight! Yeah, we're having a Foo Fight. This is probably the closest we've come to repeating an artist so far. And even then, it's not super duper close. We're repeating an artist. We kind of are. If you want the full history of the Foo Fighters, you could consider starting, maybe, with our episode on Nirvana. Episode 4. Way back on episode (laughs) 4. It's very early, so brace yourself, because the podcast has evolved a lot in 123 episodes. We're not seasoned podcasters yet. It's true. But I had a lot of fun with the Nirvana episode. I feel like I learned a lot for that, and I had a a good time. It It was one of my favorites for a while, and still has a special candle in my heart. I was looking back at the Factor Spins for that week. Oh, yeah. Uh, Well, let's see if I can remember. I haven't looked at them in a bit. They got thrown out of their own album release party because of a food fight. Yeah. Kurt Cobain lived in his car for a couple weeks. Yeah. yeah. While they were famous, not like before or something, Kurt Cobain spit all over Elton John's piano thinking it was Axl Rose. Yep, yep. I remember that one a lot. And then there's a fourth one. There's five. Wait, there's five? That was before we had the classic four. Whoa. Well... So my brain remembers something about a wooden spoon, but I think that's in hand with the time they got kicked out of the party because they, like, threw wooden spoons around, right? They had a food fight. They had a food fight, yeah, yeah, yeah. They credited their guitarist on an album. They credited, yeah, Jason Everman on Nirvana's first album, Bleach, even though he didn't play a single note on the album. That's right. And the last one might be lost on me. Kurt Cobain went by the name Kurt Cobain. Oh, wow. I did forget about that. Yeah, the mixtaper I know was going back looking to see if there's any spins he told that week that he could try to recycle on you, but they were all true. Well, well, I have to be honest. I forgot about that because that didn't make the final cut of the episode. Curged Cobain. (laughs) Nobody knows about that. Oh, it didn't? That was a cut? Yeah. It was a classic for it. Wow. It was when the mixtaper still brought extras. But yeah, it was all facts that week, so there was no uh, spins to try to recycle on you. He was disappointed. That's true. That was last time. This is this time, and we've only got Dave Grohl to talk about this time. The Foo Fighters is, you know, the pet project of Nirvana drummer Dave Grohl. Sure is. But, but my point is, I don't think this is like a duplicate, like a repeat of an artist. I consider this a sequel episode. Whoa! I know, our first sequel. Or was Nirvana a prequel and this is the main thing i don't know that remains to be seen we're still making this oh okay i don't like that because typically sequels aren't as good as the originals well sometimes they are so like you're setting this up to be a worse episode no it could be like like the middle of a trilogy maybe it's well yeah uh i guess that's still technically a sequel this is our empire strikes back of nirvana and Foo fighters content this is our dave grohl empire strikes back i'm really interested to see what our Return of the Jedi is. <laughs> you and me both. We'll get there when we get there. But our story for the Foo Fighters kind of begins concurrently with Nirvana. While Nirvana was out on the road, Dave Grohl has his guitar with him. And he starts writing all his own music, right? But he never feels super comfortable to share with the rest of the band. I mean, look at Kurt Cobain. Look at what he's coming up with for Nirvana. So he kind of plays his cards close to the chest. Kind of keeps those songs all to himself. And also his songwriting style, just a side note. It's so cool. He's obviously a drummer first. So he's got a very like rhythmically inclined mind. And so he tried to think about each string as a drum and build songs around that since that's what he understands really well since that's what he's been trained in and perfected so he's creating these really unique rhythmic riffs as a result really cool songs but he's kind of bashful and not sharing them around but when nirvana comes to an end in 1994 suddenly dave grohl finds himself with a catalog of songs and nothing to do with them there was a little bit of talk that he might join Pearl Jam or Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, but he was offered a full-time spot. He was. Yeah. 
And he turned it down because he didn't want to just be a drummer, right? He kind of wanted to break the mold a little bit. But he also kind of wanted to break the mold while staying anonymous and flying a little under the radar, kind of distancing himself from Nirvana creatively just because he's not the same thing. He's very different. So he creates this pseudonym Foo Fighters for himself. Fighters plural because he wanted people to think that it was an entire band. <laughs> Instead of just him. Because it was at first. Like, he named it before he actually had a band. That'll make people think that there's a full band here. <laughs> like, specifically, probably, like, like record producers and stuff, right? To trick them. Yeah. I also did some research into the curious term Foo Fighters. Because we talked about, we joked about it back on episode four, even. What a silly band name, kind of. And I learned some things. Foo Fighter is a term that comes from World War II. Yeah. It's what the Allied fighters would call UFOs. An aerial phenomena. So they'd be like flying up in the sky. Foo's like a nonsense word, right? Think like fooey. It's just, it's nothing. It's not a thing. Oh, I was thinking just like the FO part of UFO. Like. No, it's not like that. It's like they see these lights in the sky, right? See this thing that's not an enemy aircraft. And so they call it a foo fighter. It's not a fighter. It's a fooey fake fighter. Ah. Uh... Mm-hmm. At the time, he just kind of gave it a name to give it a name. Reflecting on it, he said, had I actually considered this to be a career, I probably would have called it something else because it's the stupidest band name in the world. <laughs> I didn't realize the name had such, like, historical origins. It's neat. Anyway, Dave Grohl gets into a studio and records 15 songs almost entirely by himself. He plays every instrument, sings every vocal, except for one guitar part on Ecstatic. But people start to hear these demos... And it kind of piques some record label interest. And he says, okay, I'm just a foo. I really am going to need some fighters if I'm going to do this. <laughs> he was a foo. They were some <laughs> fighters. Can I make it, it any more obvious? <laughs> he adds bassist Nate Mandel, drummer William Goldsmith, and former Nirvana touring guitarist Pat Smear. Woo. I know. History is repeating itself. They start doing smaller shows all over the Pacific Northwest in 1995. And their self-titled album came out that same summer. They did another long tour in the spring of 96 and decided it was time to make their second record. And this time, it's much more of a group effort. Dave Grohl does most of the songwriting himself, but of course, everyone helps pitch in on arrangements, fleshing out what the instrumentation is going to be. So in a certain sense, the color and the shape is kind of like the true debut of the Foo. Whoa, Foo debut. In 1996... Dave Grohl also had just gotten divorced from his wife, Jennifer Youngblood, which provided a lot of inspiration for the lyrics on this record. As for music, a lot of it came together during sound checks for those tours over the last year or so. Dave would start out with a riff or a melody or something that he'd been working on, and the rest of the band would just jump on it, just start to play their parts, and they would craft the songs off of that. They got to work in a Washington studio alongside producer Gil Norton. Gil Norton, I mean, was a huge figure for them as they were working through this. They wanted to make a straight-up rock record. They kind of wanted to distance themselves from grunge a little bit. They said, Norton is the guy that's going to get us there. He had previously worked with the Pixies, and the Foo Fighters were looking for harmonies, looking for clarity in their instruments. Kind of the same stuff that he did with the Pixies, they wanted for themselves. They said when he worked with them, he could distill a coherent pop song out of all the multi-layered madness. And so they gave him multi-layered madness, and he churned out the color and the shape. Whoa. And he was tough on them, too. He made them practice and work and improve, you know, a real play it dozens of times kind of thing. Grohl said that it was frustrating and it was hard and long, but at the end of the day, you listen back to what you've done and you understood why it had to be done a million times. And personally, I think it paid off. They started trying to record the color and the shape in the fall at a studio on a farm that Mendel called a converted barn with a salmon stream running through it. And it sounds like it kind of sucked. They actually just straight up ditched most of the work they did. And they decided to change. Actual recording took two months in January and February of 1997. And the surroundings weren't much better. The studio apparently, quote, moonlighted as a porn set and looked the part. But they toughed it out. They made it through. That is wild. Isn't it? I know. You can record an album anywhere. That's what that tells me. <laughs> Interestingly enough, you know, Dave Grohl set out just to be a vocalist and guitarist. Like he, like I said, kind of wanted to distance himself from drumming. But he was listening to William Goldsmith's drumming and realized it just didn't have that special sauce that he was looking for. He was hearing it a different way himself. So he decided to replace some of it, a little bit, here and there, touch it up. It started out with just Monkey Wrench, but then it kind of spiraled from there. And before too long, he had redone almost every drum track on the record. So 
he had to call Goldsmith and explain what happened. He was like, dude, I just totally replaced all your drums. I'm so sorry. I still want you in the band, please. But your drums might not be much on this album. But obviously, Goldsmith felt a little slighted by that and decided to leave the band either way. So that's a bummer. Yeah, I can understand, though. I know, me too. Like, okay, you clearly don't need me, and you clearly didn't want me on the record. Yeah. Like, I would go spend my time elsewhere. Another thing that's really cool about the color and the shape, Concept King, is that they didn't intend this, but after they put the album all together and sequenced it, you know, track by track by track, Dave Grohl realized it felt like a therapy session with the way the album flowed. It went from fear and anxiety through a series of, like, growth moments to this self-assurance at the end. He was actually so taken by this concept that he had accidentally made that he was tempted to put a therapist couch on the record cover, but ultimately decided against it. Here's a fun one that you may or may not have stumbled upon. Do you know where the color and the shape got its name? Oh, uh, yeah. They took the name, the color and the shape, oh. from their tour manager. <laughs> so no is your answer. <laughs> yeah, no's my answer. Right. It took me a moment to find it in your notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, they did. They had a tour manager who liked to visit all kinds of thrift stores and pick up all kinds of like weird, eclectic little things. One time he just bought a bowling pin, just a straight up normal bowling pin. And when they asked him why, he was like, well, I just like the color and the shape. So they said, okay, that's an album title right there. And they used the British version of color with a U because their revered producer, Gil Norton, is British. So it's a little nod to him. We need something like that. Like a bowling pin? <laughs> Yeah, like a spin it bowling pin. Or a no. spin it bowling ball. Bowling spin. Bowling spin. No. Because a ball spins. Our logo would look cool on a bowling ball. Ridiculous. But it would, you're right. I would like the color and the shape. The color would be spin it colors and the shape would be bowling ball shaped. Exactly. And then the pins could be the mix taper. <laughs> oh. Too much? I like it. Maybe too much. No, I like it. I don't love it. It's fine. The Color and the Shape came out in May of 1997, and it got a lot of critical praise for its cohesiveness. The response was positive, not like overwhelming maybe. Some people said it ended up being too overproduced, which actually reminds me a lot about what they said about Nevermind when it came out. They criticized it for being overproduced too. Dave Grohl just can't win. But that's the critics. You know, the public thought differently. The Color and the Shape peaked at number 10 on the Billboard 200, and it cracked the top 10 in seven other countries worldwide, and it certified platinum in the US, the UK, Canada, and Australia. As for the rest of the Foo Fighters' career, after The Color and the Shape, guitarist Pat Smear walked away from the group, and legendary drummer Taylor Hawkins joined the lineup. After a little spin cycle tie-in, he finished his stint as Alanis Morissette's touring drummer on her Jagged Little Pill tour. Isn't it ironic? It's never ironic. Alanis Morissette <laughs> doesn't know what irony is. But the Foo Fighters have really kind of been a massive, if not quiet, influence in the rock world since. I feel like I don't hear people talk about them maybe as much, but they certainly have left their imprint on everything. They've performed alongside legendary bands like Queen, Led Zeppelin. They went on a co-tour with Weezer called the Foozer Tour. It just, uh, you know, seems like they kind of knew everyone and were up for everything. That's my impression of the Foo Fighters. We got a longer album to talk about today. A lot of songs to hit, so I'll keep the last bit of their career brief. To date, they've released 11 studio albums. Most recently in June of this year, they've headlined festivals. They've hosted major performances and more, done a ton of stuff. Sadly, most of you probably already know or remember, Taylor Hawkins passed away in 2022, and it was kind of a huge deal in the music world. Hawkins, I mean, he was such a prolific drummer. He worked with a lot of people and contributed to a lot of songs and recordings, and yeah, it was just a hard loss. The tribute concerts in his memory were literally the stuff of legends. Like, they should go down in history. People really turned out, and it was a really incredible tribute. Foo Fighters have won 35 awards on 113 nominations, including two All Rock Awards, three Billboard Music Award nominations, five Brit Awards, and a whopping 15 Grammys on 32 nominations, which I think maybe is an indicator of their quiet impact, right? The Grammys are like industry awards. That's professionals voting on them, recognizing how good they are and their greatness and stuff. And then, I don't know, I just don't hear people talk about the Foo Fighters enough. But three of those Grammys came in 2022, by the way. So they're still at the top of their game. 
And in 2021, their very first year of eligibility, they were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But that's what I've got about the Foo Fighters. The mixtaper strikes back in this time of Factor Spin. That's going to be plenty scary. Hey, it's me, the mixtaper. Ooh, hello. Back for a brand new season of Factor Spin. That's right. The mixtaper strikes back season, as you've dubbed it. (laughs) Well, that's just because the, this is our Empire Strikes Back episode. Why wouldn't this be our mixtaper strikes back? Really? Should it be more of a the host strike back? Because you're the bad guys in this scenario? No, we're not. Yeah. But you're the villain. Okay. Sure. Either way, we ended the last season back-to-back shutouts. Mixtaper, you've got the last eight points in this game. I know. It's pretty great. Well, I'm hoping to foil your plans. Which is another reason why you guys need to strike back, because I'm on top. Ugh, I don't like it. Let's see if I can get something going this week. Well, all right, then. I'll do my best. Dave Grohl has an honorary beetle in the family. Oh, in the family. I thought you were just saying he has an honorary beetle. I was like, what? <laughs> Ringo Starr is trapped in his basement. <laughs> well, he's not an honorary beetle. That's just a normal one. I mean, he's. I think he's still honorary. I honor him. Yeah, exactly. Who's the honorary beetle? His daughter. His daughter? Why is his daughter an honorary beetle? Because Paul McCartney dubbed her one. Under what pretense? When he gave her her first piano lesson. Okay, that's just not fair. How am I supposed to take piano lessons from anyone knowing that there's someone out there that's got piano lessons from Paul McCartney? <laughs> that's a good point. How old was his daughter when this happened? Five. Oh, that she doesn't even appreciate it. Darn it. I know. What a waste. That's cute. Does she still do piano lessons with him? How many times did this happen? Just one? I think it was just one. It seems like the kind of thing that just happens once. How'd this happen? How'd this get set up? I said the Foo Fighters kind of seemed to know everyone well paul mccartney was coming to dave Grohl's house for dinner casually and while they were like waiting for the food to get ready paul mccartney was hanging out with dave's then five-year-old daughter harper and taught her some basic piano chords and the pair even wrote a song together and he dubbed her an honorary beetle they wrote a song Ooh, what's the song called about no clue it doesn't exist it probably doesn't exist it probably doesn't exist with a couple of notes she hit, she probably was just hitting them out and he was like singing something. Who knows? <laughs> this is difficult because this is a, a cute little fact and it's really easy to have this be true or false. What were they having for dinner? No clue. Okay. It would have been suspicious if you knew. If I had a food, would you have been more suspicious? Yeah. <laughs> oh, so much. Yeah. I think this is... Hey, 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 hey. They had foo. Duh. Food. Yes, <laughs> sure. I'm going to say this is... He's really pausing, audience. It'll all be cut out for time, but significant pause. He really doesn't know what to do. I'm stuck because I totally could believe this little piano lesson bit. But when you retell the story, do you retell the part where you say, and Paul McCartney says, my daughter's an honorary Beatle. Like, is that a part of it? Maybe Paul told the story and said, oh, I told her she was an honorary Beatle. That I'd believe. I'm just so up in the air. I'm going to say it's a fact. Going with fact. Locking in for me? Okay. Locked in. This is a spin. (laughs) (laughs) I thought we broke the cycle. What happened? It's exactly what you feared. Yeah? The little piano bit? Absolutely true. Uh Uh-huh. Honorary Beetle? No, no, no. (laughs) I knew it. Oh, that makes me mad because I was exactly dead on it. And I just chose the wrong side of the seesaw. You sure were. You chose the sea when you should have chose the saw. I I saw when I should have (laughs) sawed. Oh... I don't want to go with that one. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a big pause here that'll be cut out for time. He does not know what to do. I just now I'm self-conscious. I mean, (laughs) I'm on such a hot streak. (laughs) I gotta gotta be careful here. Yeah, you better make your choices correctly. The Foo Fighters have an interesting writer. Oh, man. Okay. This is just a normal fire fact, right? Yeah, normal fire. Okay. (laughs) Slow fire, even. What's on the (laughs) rider? What's on the rider? Uh, a couple of things. I mean, it's not fast fired in the sense I'm going to give you a bunch of ones to choose between, which I could have done looking back on, but we'll just kind of go through some of the more interesting ones. I'd love to. Maybe we'll do like a medium fire. Maybe. What does that mean? You, it's not normal fire. That's different than normal fire. Yeah, you got time to ask some questions about them. They don't have to be quick responses. And we'll take it kind of one by one here and we'll see if you can get a majority right. Oh, gosh. I hate it. We'll start with they ask that the promoter buy their underwear. Like from them, off their bodies, or for them to 
put on. Like for them to put on is how I interpreted it. Imagine if it was the other way around. I do like the other way around. <laughs> there is, I guess, also the third option of maybe they sell an underwear that they want the promoter to buy. I don't know. <laughs> it's true. But I took it as they like request fresh underwear at each place for the promoter to buy for them. Honestly? Okay, I could believe this. Is it a specific, like, brand of underwear? No, I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, I could understand. I mean, if you're on the road, sometimes you just want something constant when you get to the venue. That's, like, not a big expense, and it just means you've always got, like, good, fresh undies. They're not coming off a tour bus. You haven't had to struggle to do laundry, whatever. That just makes sense. So is that, you're saying that one's true? Yeah, I'm going to say that's a true on the undies. Undies are true. Heck yeah. Also on their rider is a $100 fine for any misspelling or other stupid typos on advertising materials. Is it per typo or like per thing? If I make a thousand flyers with one typo. I think it's like per like thing. So like if you messed up the flyers, that's 100. Then if you also messed up the billboard, that's 200. It's not like 100 per flyer. Right. And is it per member of the band or just total? I think just total. Why is this on their writer and not like something their PR person or agent or label is dealing with? I don't know, but it was revealed on their 2000 concert writer. No, I'm going to say this is a spin. Doesn't seem like a writer thing. Seems like it's somebody else's job to do that. This is a true fact. Okay, well, I missed that one. <laughs> they also request, and this is where it gets interesting, unopened fresh cereal that is not recycled from last night's Dio's show. Last night's what show? Dio's. D-I-O-S. Are you talking about like a specific writer from like one specific show? No, I think that's just how it was. Like that part's in pr in like quotations, like not recycled from last night's Dio shows in like... Oh, like a joke thing that they put on everything? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Is that a reference to something? I don't know. Probably something else that was touring at the time. Yeah, I can't believe fresh unopened cereal. I would guess if you're catering a lot of events, maybe you try and save uh and and eliminate food waste by doing just that but if you want to be specific about fresh you'd put it on the writer that is a true fact sweet also on the writer ketchup is to be fresh not with quote the last four millimeters end quote in the bottle why are they all so like tongue-in-cheek uh, yeah what does that mean What's the last four millimeters in the bottle? Like, it can't be an empty bottle? Basically. Like, don't give me... You know, like, sometimes you go to, like, a restaurant and you, like, go to get ketchup for your fries. You're like, oh, this one's empty. I gotta get one from one of the other tables. They don't want that. They want fresh, unopened ketchup. Sure. I... Yeah, why would anyone want ketchup bottles with just the last four millimeters in there? I sure wouldn't. Right. Does brand matter? What are they? Heinz? Hunts? Does not say. Does not say. But if you're not going to Heinz, I mean, what's wrong with you? People do other things. Yeah, people are wrong. <laughs> Maybe they're not eating it. Maybe it's for food fights. Oh. Maybe they want to throw it all around. I'm going to say ketchup's a spin. Ketchup's a spin? Ketchup is a true fact. Bummer. Two left. Two left. So this is out of six total. Yeah, and you're two for two. Do not two for two. You're two for four. Right. <laughs> An unopened pack of dentine ice gum. Okay. Dave Grohl, choose it during their sets. Put on your fresh underwear, chew your fresh gum. You'll be smelling good, feeling good, and have a full bowl of new cereal with plenty of ketchup. I think this is also a fact. This is a spin. Man, okay, so my <laughs> thought there was like, maybe you just adapted a true fact and broke it into little pieces. <laughs> so that didn't happen. That didn't happen. And one left. Their catered lunch should include soup of the day, but only vegetarian because, quote, meaty soups make roadies fart. Love that. Soup sounds delicious. And you know what? Nobody wants a farty roadie. I'm going to say this is a fact. I'm going to risk it all. Going with another fact? Yeah. This is a true fact. <laughs> Which means we went three and three. Well, that's 50-50. Yep. Don't know what to do about that one. <laughs> Then think that through. Having six of them. <laughs> there can always be a tie. We'll see how you do on the next fact. Well, how is that? That's not bowling where, you know, a spare <laughs> counts toward the next frame. That's so dumb. Okay. Maybe we do need a bowling ball. <laughs> Dave Grohl is very generous. Totally. True. <laughs> What's he generous with? Money. Time. Both. Tipping. Tipping. That's money. Not necessarily. What else does he tip with? I, no, in this scenario, it's money. I'm just saying it's not necessarily money. You can tip other things. When have you ever... Maybe just went around giving people fashion advice. Oh, giving people <laughs> tips. Yeah, maybe. Or, you know, if you're rich enough, maybe he's tipping people monkeys. I don't know. 
<laughs> that is a monkey wrench right there. <laughs> ah, what's his pattern of generosity look like? How's he tip? He leaves $1,000 tips. That's pretty generous. That'd make my day. Unless it's like a $1,000 tip on a, you know, $100,000 bill. And that's pretty sad, really. It's all about perspective. We don't need to get into that, into that on the podcast, but tipping by percentage of your bill makes no sense. I kind of agree. <laughs> Is there anything else I need to know about this fact, about Dave Grohl's generosity? Just big tipping? Why did why did he tip $1,000? I mean, to be generous. Oh, well, I'm just being like, what was the occasion? He was eating out, maybe, or receiving a service. No. This is his hotel tip. Oh. Every time he stays at a hotel, he tips the hotel at, like, people. I, guess. I assumed it was... I don't know who in the hotel he's doing this to, but... So he said he tips the hotel $1,000. I don't know if he's actually tipping the hotel, which is less generous now that I think about it, or if he's, like... It's probably cleaning <laughs> staff. But I say, is it cleaning staff? Does he, leave, like, leave $1,000, like, on his pillow when he checks out so that the cleaning staff find it? That's a pretty bold move. Is it a thousand dollars total, like split between the guy who carried up his luggage and the cleaning? I don't know. I don't know. Just thousand dollar tips when he stays in a hotel. I like it. I believe it. I'm gonna say it's true. This is a spin. You gotta be kidding me. I know nothing about his tipping habits. <laughs> wow. Oh, it seems like the kind of thing he would do. He seems like a nice guy. I was like, rich people, tip big. Good fact. Darn it. <laughs> would have been a good fact. You're right. Yeah, and you know, since we're playing by bowling rules, I guess you just, the, the tie goes to me. No, I think that means I should get the last one. No, that's not how bowling works. Well, let's see how the next one goes. If you roll a gutter, you're, you're, the spare you got before was worthless. It was worth, still worth 10. Well, it was worthless in that frame. Let's see how the last one goes. Yeah, I guess. Tell you what, tell you what. If I get this last one on you, I'll give you the second one so that you're not shut out three times in a row. Oh my goodness, <laughs> how generous of you. But if you don't get it, then it goes to me so that I still get the win and we don't 50-50 for the episode. <laughs> or you can double or nothing. What? <laughs> That's convoluted. The first plan is fine. You agree to the first proposal? Yeah. that You can win the episode. I'll just, I guess if I miss this, it'll prevent a shutout. I'll count the Foo Fighters. Medium fire facts about the writer for me. The Foo Fighters caused seismic activity. Caused seismic activity. That's fun. Like uh, when they were doing a concert, the audience responded and stomped and clapped and yelled so loud that it shook the earth. Yeah, basically. How big? What was the magnitude of seismic activity? Give me that Richter scale. I don't have the Richter scale number for you, but I do have some other stats for you. It was an audience of 50,000 people who were dancing to a Foo Fighters concert while they were on tour in Auckland, New Zealand. Okay. 50,000 isn't a huge, huge, huge... Con I mean, that's a stadium concert, right? But not sure. like a big, big stadium necessarily. Yep. What song did they dance enough to to make the seismograph dance? I don't know. And you don't know the Richter scale either? Nope. Here's the thing. This is super low stakes because I've already lost the episode. So if I'm wrong, I just get the other point. And if I'm right... I just get this one. Then the deal's off. Whoa, well, no. Well, I, well, <laughs> if you're I, gonna, if you're taking the stakes out of it, the deal's off. No, the stakes are still there. I'll shut you out again right now. No, it's the same. Nothing's changed. I think this is true. Well, I have more information. Oh, do you do? Sure. Well, I'm, I currently think this is true. What else you got? Oh, okay. Two separate monitoring stations picked up the ground shaking three times per second which registered as steady rhythmic motion at about the same level as a volcanic tremor whoa that's a lot my dilemma with this is that i know it's true about other artists i mean people have done it people have done it and i know it happens the question is did the foo fighters do it what did the foo fighters do it yeah that's the question yeah they did they did i'm gonna say it's very likely that they did lock it in fact this is a true fact he breaks the oh. curse <laughs> man 11 spins or well losses 11 losses later man. that's wild the curse is broken. The mixtaper has been dishing it out lately. 
I've been on fire. That's true. Literally, like somebody, please get the fire extinguisher or a fire blanket or something, please. Please. Well, good week. <laughs> Congratulations on that. Debatable whether it was 50-50, but technically you won it. So that's a good start to the season for you. Hey, even if we counted fact two as a 50-50, then it's 2-1-1 and I still win. So either way, I won the episode. <laughs> Whatever. It's a whole mess. It's a whole mess. You didn't have faith in yourself. You could have won the whole episode. Can you blame me? I mean, the host team has been struggling. Yeah. Listen, you're finally learning that the power of the mixtaper while slow at times to present itself it always it's undefeatable when it arrives apparently you, you may have been winning a lot of the battles but i'm coming for that mixtaper war <laughs> sure it's like a normal war but it's wearing a mask <laughs> <laughs> Will we see you next week at all for Spencer Wonderland? Do you have any plans for that? Oh, uh, well, I'll be up there in the holiday blimp. Uh, I hear you guys are doing another kind of bracket elimination thing for Spencer Wonderland. Let me know where the stadium is this time around, and I'll get the blimp there to cover it all live. I gotta go find where I got those reindeer last year. Yeah, we'll be doing another naughty or nice, so I'm looking forward to that. But we'll see you then. Happy holidays, Merry Christmas, and uh, until we see you next time, keep doing your thing. Yeah. Welcome back, Connor. Welcome back, me. At least the dry spell is broken. Maybe we can actually get a win in future weeks, but right now, we just got one measly point. Yeah, not off to a good start with the new season. No, but so be it. Let's talk about the album cover of The Color and the Shape. What do you think? Interesting color. Interesting, Interesting shape. shape. Yep. Interesting font. What a cool font, right? I know. The thing on the album cover. Yeah, well, tell me about it. What is it? Well, it looks like a molecule, but really, it's not. Listen, I don't know if I would have went right to molecule, but really? I guess. Well, I don't know. What do you go right to? I don't know. I go to, like, for some reason, I feel like, like, right outside the frame should be, like, a puppet master's hand with, like, uh, strings controlling all the balls. I don't know. Oh, okay. It is a little bit of, like, an abstract art piece. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It looks like... Uh, a couple sets of those like ball clacker toys that are really annoying all got tangled up together. Oh, I love clackers. They're a blast and they are super annoying, but you're right. <laughs> People don't really know what it is for sure, but the leading theories are that it's an inside joke for the band that nobody gets, or it could possibly be a riff off of or a tribute to some of Gil Norton's work with the Pixies, since it bears a bit of resemblance to their album artwork too. So there you have it. What do you like better, the colors or the shapes? The colors. I can get behind that. It's a very cool shade of blue. It is. I like the, It's almost the shade of blue of my car. Well, how about that? It's the color of the shirt I'm wearing right now. Whoa, what a quinky dink. It's actually the red is kind of the color of the shirt I'm wearing now. Whoa, you ready to talk about these songs? You know it. Let's talk about all the songs on the color and the shape. I mean, there's a lot of them. There's 14 of them, but honestly, I think it'll go pretty quick. Some of them are quicker to talk about than others. Some of them are very short. Yeah, some of them are quite short, almost interlude-ish. And the first song that's quite short and virtually interlude-ish or intro-ish is Doll. Intro-lude. Intro-lude. Yeah, a little bit. Dave Grohl actually has spoken on a lot of these songs, which is super great and helpful and good to contextualize. Of Doll, he said, is basically a song about being afraid to enter into something you're not prepared for. And so right off the bat, we get the sense of, I guess, going into the therapy session. I'm afraid. I'm not ready for this. Like, you can see that self-doubt evident right away. Doll me up in my bad luck. What do you think about the tone? What did, what did you expect from the Foo Fighters? I mean, did you have any expectations for the Foo Fighters? I guess we didn't talk about it, but I don't know what you know. Happy Nirvana. Okay. I think that's not super far off. I, I mean, I feel like throughout the album, you could definitely see, like, <sighs> traces of stuff Nirvana might have done, especially in the chord structure and in some of the lyrics. I feel like I wouldn't be surprised if Nirvana had put out some of these songs, you know? Yeah. But they're not all happy. No, they're not all happy. I guess, I think I've maybe brought this video game up before. Is it Rock Band? No. <laughs> but I have brought that one up a lot. <laughs> yeah. I think I've brought up Disney's Extreme Skate Adventure before. For the PS2? I don't think so. It's a skateboard game, but you're skating around as Disney characters throughout different Disney worlds. Okay. No, have I not brought that one up? I feel like I've thought it before. I've just maybe never brought it up. <laughs> I've never heard of it, so... Oh, I like going into this, I was like, I feel like this whole album could be the soundtrack for that game, but not a single song is on that game. Good to know. At least that sets the expectations. But how's Doll? I mean, for me, knowing a little bit of Foo Fighters, Doll was not what I expected the first time I put this album on. Doll was fun. It went by very fast. Yeah, it does. Honestly, kind of thankfully. Because 
and we explode right into Monkey Wrench. Honestly, just a highlight track on the album, pretty close to right off the bat, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, but don't correct me. I think Monkey Wrench is so solid. Yeah, no, no corrections here. It's a good song. Right, rock on. Monkey Wrench spent 15 weeks on the Billboard Modern Rock charts. Dave Grohl says Monkey Wrench is a song about realizing that you are the source of all the problems in a relationship, and you love the other person so much you want to free them of the problem, which is actually yourself, which is deep. And I mean, such a real emotion. I don't want to be your monkey wrench. I don't want to be the thing that stops you from achieving your goals or your plans. Like I will remove myself from the situation even if I don't want to because I want what's best for you and I don't think it's me. Holy crap. I went into this album. I specifically waited to listen to it until I could get to my headphones. Good choice. Because this felt like a headphone song rather than a car song or a headphone album instead of a car album. I think for the first listen, that's probably the better way to go. Once you know it, like I listened to it in the car today, and it rocks. Everlong turned up way too loud. It's great. Maybe. But definitely you want to get the nuance through headphones. Yeah, I really like the way this one sounds in the headset. It's very encompassing. Right. Like, it's loud, but you can, like, hear. It's not just, like, noise. You can, like, hear the intricacy in the mm -hmm. in the instrumentation. Yeah, it's that Gil Norton multi-layered madness into a pop song. Monkey Wrench. Just, it rocks so hard. I really can't praise the guitar playing enough. I, I knew you were going to fanboy the guitar this whole episode. Whole album. I'll try not to, but definitely just know that I do. Yeah, he will, though. <laughs> I also like his voice. I mean, that's the thing we didn't hear very much on Nevermind. And, I mean, he carries this record. Uh, Monkey Wrench was catchy. And it had my it had my uh, head apples quivering because of all the earworms. Uh, <laughs> it's super catchy. It's a super memorable song. But, but, but a song that I found myself liking more was Hey Johnny Park. That's interesting. Why do you think that is? They're, on a surface level, a little bit similar. Ballad. <laughs> I don't think Johnny Park is too bad. Balladish. No, it totally is. Most of the, like, all the lyrics, like the verses and stuff, are all very smooth and full of emotion and kind of stripped back. And then they ramp up for, like, the chorus. But even that is still very rock ballad y. Well, that's true. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Like, there's a lot of that going on. I just mostly am thinking about, like, the choruses and stuff are vague. But you're right. The verses do cut back a little bit. But not in the same, like, degree that Doll does. But you can have a big chorus on a ballad and it still be a ballad. Yeah, sure. It's more about the tempo. I'd say even though the chorus gets big, I, I don't know. To me, it's still ballad tempo for a rock song. Sure. Yeah, I get that. What's interesting about this record is I think a lot of songs kind of walk that line in a couple interesting ways. Yeah. Some certainly do not at all, but they just have a knack for the kind of the slow tempo power, like, I don't know, not ballad. Like Monkey Wrench comes in, it comes in up tempo. Yeah. Hey Johnny, Park starts out with that slow drum, bum, 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 bum. and then even the guitar, the bum, 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 da -dum, bum, 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 da -dum. That's still just like a solid beat. It's not like fast. Right. So the reason that they named this song, Hey Johnny Park, is because it's kind of about and written for just one of Dave Grohl's childhood friends. He said, when I was young, my best friend was a kid who lived across the street from me called Johnny Park. And we were like brothers from the age of five to 12. I haven't heard from him since I was about 14 years old. And I thought if I named a song after him, he might call. I'm not sure if he ever did call or the song actually did reconnect them. But honestly, what a cool premise. That is a cool premise. It's a good idea. If you got a platform like this, might as well send up the bat signal for Johnny Park. If we ever fall out of touch, I'll release a podcast called Hey James and see if that uh see if that gets my attention. Yeah. I'll be honest, it probably won't. I I'm not looking for my own name on podcasting platforms. But mm. if it gets big enough, I guess it could. Disappointing, I guess. We shouldn't ever fall apart then because no way for us to get back in touch. That's no conceivable <laughs> way. Maybe if Dave Grohl, if you had Dave Grohl write a song for me though, I might take notice. Oh, okay. So that's my in. Yep. Gotta get in with Dave Grohl first. And he could be an honorary Beatle. Oh. You could, no, you couldn't because he can't grant that. You could be honorary Foo. Oh, that's honestly, I'll take that. Who wouldn't? I also really like, side note about Johnny Park, last thing. Really love that line in the second verse. Your eyes still remind me of angels that hover above. Eyes that can change from blind to blue. Beautiful. It is beautiful. Mm-hmm. What'd you think about my poor brain? I'm trying to think of something funny to say there. <laughs> but your poor brain can't do it. It started my least favorite. With that kind of loud noise and stuff at the beginning? Yeah. 
Yeah, I just didn't care for that. Okay, sure. Wasn't my cup of brain. Oh, wasn't my cup of food. Food brain. <laughs> Girl says this song is an experiment with dynamics. Whether it's the lyrics or the sound of the song, it's just going from dreamy vocals to screamy vocals. Jackson 5 to Black Sabbath, sling it all in there. And I think that's true. I like the transition. I like that this song keeps us in flux and ebbing and flowing. And we never really get comfortable in My Poor Brain, which I think is the point. I enjoyed the, the parts that weren't like loud noise forte part of the dynamics. I like the piano stuff. I'm sure you did. <laughs> I actually like the louder stuff. Yeah, because of the guitars and what the guitars are doing. Uh-huh. <laughs> that's, that's not not a part of it. You had to try to pull a sneaky fanboy there. <laughs> Maybe a little. I like the harmonics they do, though. I mean, really, very smart. And what do you think about the screamy vocals? Eh. I know that's... Maybe not always your thing. Wasn't on this one. That's sad. This is a song, honestly, my poor brain. I've never played your Disney skater game, but I can see it being in the soundtrack for a skater game. It's got that feel. Yeah, probably not the Disney one, though. <laughs> Maybe not. I don't know. Just in general, good good video game soundtrack music, but I don't mean that in like a bad way. Like a cool song I would want to hear and go look up if I heard it in a game, you know? I love it. It's, he's just so in love with this person. He's pining so hard. And when things are hard or when they can't be together, like he imagines them being together, it's torturous for him and for his poor brain. He locks up. He can't do anything. I like it a lot. Now, is it wind up or is it wind up? No, no, it's wind. It's wind up. Oh, okay. Star check. Because you could tell because when he says, hope you never see me wind up. Oh, uh, okay. Well, sometimes the title isn't in the song, so I didn't know. Maybe it was still called Wind Up. Yeah, no, it's not. Not not quite. I'm going to fanboy the guitar for a moment. Really? If that's okay. I don't know. It's fine. Well, fine, I won't. No. No, 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 no. It's fine. Point rescinded. Point rescinded. No, it's fine. <laughs> this one, it's very easy to not pay attention to what the guitar is doing. It's very easy to, for it to just be a ba 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 Like, it's just there, and you're like, yeah, whatever. But if you, like, focus in on it, it's doing some fun stuff. It truly is. And there's so many spots in Wind Up where it follows that vocal to a T. Uh-huh. Really love it. Dave Grohl says, This is the story of the relationship between the journalist and the musician. He said, It drives me insane when I hear musicians that don't understand how fortunate they are that they don't have to go and pump gas for 12 hours a day. They can sit on their couch and smoke pot and complain to their friends that they hate it when someone comes up and says that he likes their band. There are two sides. The reluctant rock star... And then there's the prying journalist that almost lives for the reluctant rock star. Mm. It's just talking about the hand you've been dealt. He doesn't love the phrase, the hand you've been dealt. He said he's had a lot of BS jobs in his life, and it's way more fun just to play music. Yeah. And it seems like it. That's one thing I think this album exudes. Fun. I can tell this is the kind of music he really loves making. I think it's a lot of fun to play. I just, I could tell that he's so into it. And I love that. Wind Up is so short. If I only had one word to describe this album, I don't think I'd go with fun. I'd go with a different F word. Freaking, but you'd also need the word awesome? No. Fantastic? Foo. Foo. Oh, that's good. <laughs> this album exudes foo. This is a very foo <laughs> album. It foos fully. <laughs> now, do you consider Up in Arms a ballad? It's a tough call because it starts out unquestionably. Yeah, sure. Well, it starts out that way for at least like the first minute of the song, which is like half the song. Of half of it. I want more of this song. That's maybe a thing we can get into in a minute. You're right. I still consider it a ballad. Certainly. In fact, I mean, Dave Grohl himself calls it a typical love song. Boom. Boom. It's all about how you got to tough it out through the hard times. The rain is here and you, my dear, are still my friend. He always forgets, always leaves, always has to come back up in arms again. I want more of the song. That's what I was saying. I think 2.15 is too short. I want more. I love that Rocky part. Well, it's because it's really, I guess, two songs in one. Yes, kind of. Half the song is fast, half of it's ballads. Like, I want more of both halves. And what's annoying about it is that the softer, quieter half is one of my favorite softer, quieter parts on the album. And then the louder, more upbeat half is one of my favorite stretches of louder, upbeat songs on the album. And they both kind of get truncated to fit together disappointing i would double the length of this song fully double it triple it what no no uh, why not quadruple it <laughs> wow that's a lot of up in arms eight minutes still not the longest song we've done no true if they lengthened up in arms they'd be my hero my hero they would be that'd be big what do you think of my hero second most popular song on the album yeah 
no surprises there. I think, it, I mean, it's probably one of the top, most popular Foo Fighter songs of all time. Probably. What did you think of it, though? Good? Bad? I hated it. Hated no, it? Okay. Sad? <laughs> I'm kidding. I just thought that'd be funny to say after <laughs> talking about how beloved it was. Second most popular. Terrible. <laughs> it's another one that the guitar, that da 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 it kind of gave me Halloween vibes. <laughs> oh, yeah, I guess a little bit. Not really. No. I like the chorus. I like it when they do the slower lyric. Like when he's like, there goes my hero. I like that part a lot. Of course. Mm, those are the songs I keep gravitating to, are the ones where they sing more in that style than the faster lyrics. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And I, I think that's why this is such an interesting album, because so many of their lyrics are like that. Yeah, even though the music is just going a mile a minute. It's put over frantic music with a lot of interesting chord changes, a lot of fun shifts to major chords that you might not expect in places. Very reminiscent, like I talked about on Nirvana, but very different and distinct and cool. I actually really love the riff in these verses. The Halloween-y part that you were talking about. Yeah. It really appeals to me. Super cool. I believe it. Can you play that part? Yeah, I probably could. Will you play that part? I mean, probably not. Oh, okay. What do you think about the hook of this song? There goes my hero. He's ordinary. How's that strike you? I like it. You, don't, you know, not all heroes wear capes. Sort of vibe. That's true. Not all heroes fight foo. But the legendary ones do. This one does. Yeah. Dave Grohl said that my hero is my way of saying that when I was young, I didn't have big rock heroes. I didn't want to grow up and be some big sporting hero. My heroes were ordinary people that I have a lot of respect for and are just solid, everyday people. People you can rely on. And I think it's cool, you know, to be a person who associates with so many, like, legends in music, right? And contributes to the music legend himself as a songwriter and an artist. Yeah. I think it's cool to point that spotlight back on the people that actually, like, helped make him and bring him up to where he is. And kind of have been there at every step along the way. Hey, James. What? Just wanted to let you know the mixtape is my hero. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair, you know? Sure, I guess. He's ordinary. The mixtape may be my hero, but I still see you. Oh. <laughs> Okay, that's great. I'm glad. See You is the rare instance where the song kind of stays on one level. This one kind of presents itself early and never changes much. Yeah. And I honestly think it was refreshing. Yeah, it comes in very differently. Yeah. See You. That got stuck in my head. Because <laughs> it's so good. Dave Grohl says that See You is just another pop song. It was the one song that nobody wanted to put on the record, but it's my favorite song. But yet it still got there. <laughs> yeah. He says, I think the only reason it ended up on the record was that I redid the drum track. See, again, he's replacing all those drums. But he said he redid the drum track to make it sound like Crazy Little Thing Called Love by Queen. Oh, I can hear that. I very much get Crazy Little Thing Called Love vibes from this track. Crazy Little Thing Called Love. To see you. It's fun. It's light. And I think to check back in to the concept, I think See You is a great marker of the progress we've been making as we've journeyed through this therapy session. Considering where we started with Doll and Monkey Wrench and self-doubt and, you know, just, just that headspace. Like, we're not fully realized and healed up yet, but we're clearly much better off than we were in that self-deprecating phase. Mm. This is a jaunty song. Also, a lot of oohs in here, which I love. Makes it super sing-alongable. Been a while since we've had a good oo song. Yeah, or oo with the foo. Oh, I like it. I do too. And you know what I'm pretty sure you didn't like? Going for a song I'm almost certain you hated. Enough Space. Well, I actually really enjoyed, at the start of the song, the way the... Went from, like, left to right across my... It like, felt like I was going in a circle around my head. Yeah. And then the funky guitar comes in, dong, dong, dong. And then next song. Uh. <laughs> then, see, see, I knew it because you know why? I think this song reminded me significantly of Nirvana's song Stay Away. Was that one I hated? Yes. Yeah, I don't think you like Stay Away very much. And I don't think you like this one very much for similar reasons. It's pretty light on lyrics, first of all. I'm the instrumental guy. That's not a, that's not a negative. Yeah, well, but the lyrics that are there are screamed a lot. They sure are. <laughs> probably more intensely than anywhere else on the album, which is mostly why I said you probably wouldn't like it. Correct. Yeah. Well, Grohl says it's actually about a movie called Arizona Dreaming, one of his favorite films. And I wonder if it would be better or more impactful maybe if I'd seen Arizona Dream. I also, I couldn't find a movie called Arizona Dreaming. So I think he's talking about Arizona Dream. Doesn't matter. Still haven't seen it. I like Enough Space. 
in just kind of the sense that it fills a space on this album. It's a good way out of See You and a good way into February Stars. I think it's a nice interlude type piece. I think you could have gone from See You right into February Stars, but that's just me. Well, you probably could have. It's true. February Stars is one of the... I mean, I listened to this album for a month on my Albums of the Month playlist way, way back months and months ago. February Stars is a song that just struck something in me and stuck with me hard, like months and months later. I still remember February Stars, and I was really looking forward to talking about it on the podcast. There's just something about it. First of all, it's length, right? If you like it, you got plenty of it. But also, it's just pretty. You know, it's a song about wishing and longing and hanging on until all the good things come your way and you find yourself where you truly belong. It's very wistful, but like not in a in an intangible way. Like, you know it's coming your way. You know you're going to get it. Just got to wait for it. It was my least favorite of what I'm calling the ballads. Wow, really? Even when it gets all big at the end, February stars... Because, I mean, that's my favorite part of the song. One of my favorite parts on the album. Maybe I need to give it another shot. Maybe I saw a bad taste in my mouth from enough space. You didn't have enough space between enough space and February starts? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I can believe it. Because, like, I'm thinking back on the song and kind of looking back, I'm like, why didn't I like it as much as the others? I think melodically it's a little weaker on the beginning parts until it breaks out. Maybe. Maybe it just didn't get big soon enough. It is quiet. It's super quiet for like the majority of the song. Right. Maybe it just didn't build quickly enough. I think that could be. You kind of got to be patient for it, but it does pay off. Or maybe it was just because I was listening to this on thinking about what do the stars look like on February 29th? Leap day? I don't know. I actually just had a thought in saying that. I think this song kind of makes us wait to break out. Just like the lyrics talk about, right? Being patient and hanging on by the tips of your fingers, just waiting for things to come your way. You get it. The song pays off in the way that it describes paying off. I like that a lot. It makes it even more my favorite now. Favorite, not favorite favorite, but I like it a lot. Maybe. My favorite favorite is probably Everlong. You like your favorite song? Is that your playlist pick? It very well could be. I would love for you to pick it on the playlist first, and so I could go next and see what you think. <laughs> but wow, Everlong... One of the first two Foo Fighters songs I ever knew. And like you so often do, I knew about Everlong from a rock band or Guitar Hero game. Nice. Yeah. Well, wow, did I fall in love with it. It's incredible. And uh, shocking no one. I feel guilty every time I say it now. It has a great guitar part. Just for the <laughs> record, it does. Can you 100% this song on Legendary? Here's the thing. I think I discovered this on Rock Band on my iPod Touch. Oh. So I played with my thumbs. And yeah, I could in that situation. Weird. <laughs> give me a real Guitar Hero guitar, I don't know. But give me a, an iPod and some thumbs and enough time to remember it. Sure, probably. Fair enough. It's a lot easier that way because there's only four notes. I don't know. Everlong was okay. Okay. Well, what was okay? What's that mean? What did you like? What did you not like? It was a good song, but it's placement on the album. That makes it struggle. Really? In the healing section of the therapy session? Well, I'm just saying, if it was like a beginning track, if it was like in the first five, I'd be like, heck yeah, this is awesome. Like, it'd be a good set. But by the time we get to it, I've heard pretty much all the stylistic things they do in the song spread out on other songs. So it's nothing really too new. Oh, I don't know. Like, it just feels like another Foo Fighter song at this point. Wow. Like, you know, like how we talk about how See You, like, stands out, right? It does. Like, it does. It, Everlon doesn't do that. If it, it kind of blends in to the Foo Fighter camouflage. Interesting. It's just another ingredient in the recipe. It's not like, it's not jumping out at me. I guess I understand. I've always thought that Everlong kind of stands alone in a very unique way on this album. Well, that's because you heard it alone on its own first. That's probably what it is. <laughs> and so then you get to it and you're like, yeah, I know this song. And like to me, who hasn't heard any of these songs and really hadn't heard much of the Foo Fighters before this, the first 10 tracks were the first 10 things I heard. And so by the time I got to this, I was just like, yep, this is another one. It's fair enough. Like I liked My Hero better. Ooh. I disagree, personally. That's not to say one is better or not better. I just did I, I'm on the opposite scale of likes. And and I, maybe it'll grow on me if I give it a few more listens. And and you might very well give it a few more listens when it's on the playlist, maybe. Yeah. You know, uh, but in this scenario where it was preceded by 10 other tracks and followed up by four more, it just uh, kind of got lost. Wow. 
Okay, fair enough. I wanted to talk about his placement on the album. I mean, I get why it has to go here. I'm just saying, to a first time and one time listener, it would have helped it if it was higher. No, sure. Looking at that song specifically. Yeah. That's just another thing I'm noticing about looking at the album. Like, we start with a lot of quicker tracks, right? I mean, one song is four minutes, but mostly they're like two and a half, 215, 123. You know, like the first half of the album has a lot of quick tracks. Maybe that's part of my problem. Oh, yeah. As things started to lengthen out on the back half, where we get like almost five minutes for February start. Stars, four minutes for Everlong, five minutes for Walking After You. It was getting more and more muddy. Yeah. Okay. But I think that's indicative too of like moving through the therapy session, right? We come in, we're angry, we're confused, we're like just just fractured and going from thing to thing to thing. And as we kind of start to work through things and understand and put pieces together to make sense of the world and the way things are, we start to kind of get more drawn out thoughts, more introspective I don't know. I, I just like that a lot. I think that's fun. What did you think about Walking After You? Five minutes long and it's not the longest song on the album. Yeah, just more that fatigue. Fatigue. I liked, again, the instrumentals were interesting on this one. But at this point, I don't even know if I was listening to the lyrics anymore. Because they were just Charlie Brown like adults to me at this point. Just wah, 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 wah. Oh, that's not good. I thought this was a song you would like more. As like a softer ballad type song. I think I remember liking it more than ever long, but I still just, I couldn't tell you what the song was about lyrically. I remember some of the, some of the music stuff, but I could not tell you what the song was about. Fair. It's a quiet song all the way through. Kind of in the vein of See You, it finds its level and it holds the line. Uh, See You is different though. It, was, it reminds me more of... Uh, well, like the first part of February Stars? February Stars, where like most of it is... I just mean in its consistency. Like it hits that mark and never deviates. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. It, yeah, it's definitely more at the level of February Stars beginning. Well, in Dave Grohl's words, it's an emotional, sappy song about getting dumped. And, uh, you know, this time, as we're healing through this therapy sesh, he, instead of letting love walk away from him... He's going to chase it down and actually put in work to make things right and better. Oh, it's like the Zach. Is it that the Zach Brown band that does the while she's walking away? Is that Don't be falling in love while she's walking away. Yeah. You mean the Zach Brown band featuring, is it Alabama? Yeah. I don't know. Kind of like that, but but up like the opposite. Like, yeah. if you walk away from me, I'm going to actually try and fix things instead of just letting you go. Yeah. Yeah, it was a cool song. This one's a cool song, too. I like it a lot. This song is also, fun fact, in the soundtrack for the 1998 X-Files movie. Whoa! Which I think I've heard nothing good about, but yeah. Yeah, well, that's because, like, everybody was, like, super happy with the show. And then the movie, like, promised to answer a bunch of questions that it didn't answer. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Didn't deliver. I think it's such a cool, significant choice to end the song with the line, another heart is cracked in two, I'm on your back. Because it reinforces that same idea that he's here and determined to put in that work. Like, that's the, the emotion we're left with in Walking After You. And I like it a lot. But then we get the longest song on the album and, you know, the original closing track of the album, New Way Home. Oh, it was the original closer. Yeah, the color and the shape never actually made the original album cut. It only came out on special editions later. Oh, but we're going to talk about it anyways? Yeah, eventually. But first, we got to talk about New Way Home. Just usually don't include bonus tracks. Well, I know, but it's included on the Spotify album, and I listen to it the full time. Every time I listen to this album on the way through. So it kind of counts in my brain. Gotcha. Was New Way Home still part of the muck? Part of the fugu? <laughs> the fugu. It do fugu. Good grief. A few. And by that, I simply just mean it pulled me out of it a little bit, but I still was kind of fugu'd. Ah, that's no good. Good. That's no good. No goo. Yeah. It's no goo. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've made it to the end of the therapy session. He's fully healed now. Hashtag year of healing. And he's finding a new way through the hard times, facing his woes head on in a productive, healthy way. Head down, always moving on and on and on and on. I like it a lot. Dave Grohl says it's about winding your way through all these emotions and pitfalls and ups and downs, but at the end of the day, you realize that you're not scared anymore and you're gonna make it and find your new way home. I actually liked when it got softer and around like the three minute mark, which goes against everything I've been complaining about, I know, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're so inconsistent on this one. I know. I think I'm just looking. The earlier tracks had more movement to them, and these later tracks have been very, very... Stagnant? 
stagnant. That's the good word for it. See, that's I think that's what I like about this album is the way that it progresses from one kind of song to another. You know, it, it grows as we move through it. Maybe. So I think in that way, it kind of offers a wide array of songs and styles and things in the same length of time as a normal album. But yeah, we end the album with title track, the color and the shape cut from the initial release. Dave Grohl says it was almost like another... <laughs> weenie beanie sort of song just another screaming fast hardcore song and we decided not to put it on because it was a step backwards we've done that already and they sure have i you're 100 right what you said about everlong i disagree with but if you said it about the color and the shape totally good i was gonna say it about this one too so oh good i totally agree <laughs> i don't have many thoughts on the color and the shape the actual song it's a uh, letdown of a title track. Oh, wow. Strong words. Well, you know me. I'm extra critical about title tracks. I know this song came later. It did. <laughs> but they wrote it at the time and just chose to exclude it. Really? The album was named after a bowling pin, so. Yeah. I'm extra critical of title tracks. If you're going to name your album after a song, better be a good song. True. Or face my wrath. I was also curious if that line, still a bleach one anyway, that's right, was a Nirvana reference or not. I can't tell. And it might be, and it might not be. Who's to say? Who's to say? Or should I say, who's to say? Who's to say? <laughs> but that's the color and the shape, and that's the color and the shape. And now it's time for final spin. Yeah. I have a lot of things to say. I like this album a lot. I think there's a good amount of lyrical depth here musically. I feel like I engage with all these songs really well. I think there's a, a lot of points of access, right? If you like heavy rock songs, you got somewhere to latch on in almost every track. If you like slower ballad songs, you got somewhere to latch on. If you like a good guitar, you got something. If you like a powerful vocal, you got something. If you like a soft vocal, you got something. So many of these songs have so many moving parts. I think it helps the album flow really, really well. So I'm giving music in 87. How did you feel about the overall concept of the album? The therapy session, Concept King? I didn't pick up on it the first time through, but when you told me about it and I was thinking back on it, yeah, I can see it. Okay, solid, kind of holds up, it's in there. I'd give it an 85 for lyrics. It has its moments, but I do like a lot of them a lot. Instruments of production, oh man, I couldn't praise the instruments of production enough. The production is so cool. Gil Norton crushed it. We talked so much about how he makes everything audible and clean, yet still so kind of crunchy and crisp crunchy yeah i think that's a skill in and of itself plus great instruments the dude's an awesome drummer and you know just an instrumentalist his singing is always on point giving it a 90 and the overall vibe also gets a 90 i think this album is awesome and it honest i haven't yet but honestly it makes me want to dig much more into the foo fighters discography you want to be get uh shoulder deep in the foo Yes, I do. And that gives this album an overall score of 88.3, which puts it at number 152. Of the episodes we've done so far, it ends just above the head and the heart, just below another of our pseudo-concept albums, Kendrick Lamar. I don't expect to hear a similar score from you, if I'm honest. Well, then you expect right. Yeah, I know. For me, this album lived up to expectations. Of which you had none? Well, my expectations were happy... Nirvana, or up, more specifically, upbeat Nirvana. Upbeat, I'll give you. You did say happy at first, and I, I don't think that's quite right. I did say happy at first, and I realized I, I really meant upbeat. Now that's more correct, yeah. I just think it was too long. I know you said you didn't think it felt too long, but... Well, it is a bit longer than normal. It's a 50-minute record. It wouldn't have been too long if all the songs stayed that same 2.30, 3.30 mark. But we got down towards the end. It was just like 4.40, 5.03, 5.40. It was like, oh, man. <laughs> really, it's way down the back half of the album for me. That makes a lot of sense. And that's the problem because the back half is what you're going to make your last impressions on. That's the taste it's going to leave in your mouth. Yeah, but you also don't want to weigh down the first half because it's where the first impression's made. And you, know, you can't change a first impression. True. So, you know, I'm going to give this one six Fugus out of ten. Six? Oh, that's actually a little higher than I thought you might go. Before you set a score. You're right. I, oh, okay. Oh. Five Fugus out of ten. <laughs> Whoa! Okay. Want to make it four? <laughs> well, no, I was thinking in the five, and I wouldn't be surprised about a four, but I thought five. It's just been a minute since you've... Well, I was... It was going to go under Kendrick Lamar at the bottom of my sixes. You mean exactly where I put it? <laughs> Oh. Right below Kendrick. <laughs> yeah. But then you said that was a little high, and I looked at what was at the top of my fives, and I saw English Rain by Gabrielle Applin. 
No, 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 no. Bottom of the sixes. Bottom of the sixes. We're back. No, I I liked it better than English Rain. Okay. Sticking to my guns. Sticking to my foo. Sure. Like ACDC. Sticking to my guns. But you know what? That's really a metaphor for. <laughs> Six Fugus. Six Fugus. My top three in album order. Monkey Wrench. Uh-huh. That's not surprising. Hey, Johnny Park. Also not surprising after what you said about it, especially since you said you liked it better than Monkey Wrench and just picked Monkey Wrench. Oh, wait, before you, I'm just going to remind you, you're out of Conorable Mentions. Oh, I know. Okay, I'm just making sure. Which is why you're getting some noticeable snubs, because my third and final top three is See You. Whoa! <laughs> wow! That's wild. Yeah, there was a big hitter that was going to be my Conorable Mention until I realized I couldn't have it, so, uh... It got snubbed. Wow. See you made your top three. Yeah, it was just different, and I really liked it. It's the only thing that stuck with me, really, from the bottom half. Good it is to see you, because it is good. See you. So, I mean, the obvious notable snub in that big jump is my hero. Yeah. I would consider Everlong a snub, but I don't think that was ever in the running for you, and it also sounds like you kind of hated the back half of the album. It was not in the running for me, but yeah, you know. I'm hero-less, unfortunately. No, so you are. All the ordinary people in my life are villains, not heroes. I've got the mixed taper. <laughs> sure. There goes my daster. <laughs> He's such a villain. As for my playlist pick... You're not taking Everlong. No. <laughs> I know. That means I'm going to have to take Everlong. I mean, you don't have to. No, nah, but I do. I honestly could go any of those three. I, I have reason to pick any of those three. Probable cause. Yeah. I mean, I'll never be your monkey wrench. Or see you. Ba-ba-ba-ba-da. I don't know what to pick. This is a rough one. What are your thoughts? I know. Maybe you should flip a three-sided coin. Ooh. My thoughts are, I really like the energy of monkey wrench on the playlist. I really like the sing-songiness of see you. I don't pick very many high energy songs. I'm I typically go with the ballads and stuff. I think I'll take Monkey Wrench. Oh, okay. It's one that I feel like would translate to the car really well. I can feel myself like next time I'm taking a road trip down to see you. <laughs> I'm see ironically you. not picking see you, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I'm coming down. I'm coming down your way, and I'm just driving down the interstate. You know, I know I'll never be your Monkey Wrench. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we kind of did a role reversal. Then I'm taking Everlong. Lock it in. Confirmed. I'll take the slower of the songs yeah you could get the energy pick this time sure monkey wrench for me well i believe that'll do it that's another episode down yeah i think we've covered all our bases just now all the typical plugs heck yeah typical plugs boom instagram at spin pod official boom x at spin it pod boom www.spinitpod.com that's the website all the stuff all the blooper reels all the bonus content all the fun stuff like the new bonus content that's hopefully out at this point us making Alan Jackson's favorite food. Pineapple monstrosities. <laughs> one of Alan Jackson's favorite foods and one food Alan Jackson's never heard of. Guess who makes which? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can find us anywhere you listen to podcasts, especially here. Where you're currently listening. So if you found us here, yeah, congratulations. Like, rate, follow, all that jazz. It annoyingly helps. All that jazz. Well, Tell a friend. Tell a friend. Who doesn't have enough foo in their life? Tell your foodless friends about this podcast. <laughs> and we'll see you next week for our Spinter Wonderland holiday special. We'll be counting down the best holiday tracks. You won't want to miss it. They'll be voted on by you, your audience. So we will see you next time. And until then, seven short days away, have a happy holiday season and keep spinning. The keep and the spinning. That's good. Thank you. I can't help but notice we're kind of like in a weird short, I hope, monkey era? Are we? Well, the mixtaper just brought a fact about Alan Jackson's monkey. Now there's a song called Monkey Wrench. Uh, the mixtaper also made a joke about Dave Grohl tipping people monkeys. Wild. Uh, yeah, I don't quite understand it. I <laughs> don't pretend to and I don't want to. I just, for the record... I can't say anything about what the mixtaper's gonna do or what monkeys will pop up on the holiday special, but I know our New Year's special will continue our monkey trend. What? Welcome to the era of the monkey. <laughs> <laughs>